One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. End of test. This is Houston's contact with a test. One, Roger, and your lock. Clear here. All <laughs> on the moon at the Galactic Chloe Show. Today, robotics will be on the menu. And to discuss this topic, we have the pleasure to have here with us Professor Jamie Pike, head of a robotic laboratory at EPFL. Hi, Jamie. Great to have you here with us. Hi, Chloe. How are you? Very good. Was the flight comfortable? Was anti-gravitational. She said, do you love me? I tell her only partly. I only love my bed and my mom. I'm sorry. Could you tell us a bit more about you? I'm the founder and director of Reconfigurable Robotics Lab at EPFL. And what are you doing? We build very unconventional robots that do not look like the robots that you imagine they would look like. So you, you were very well renowned as a scientist in the robotic field. Could you tell us more about what makes your research different from others? We build robots that are not necessarily optimized for a single task, but these robots are optimized for multitasking. Think about robots that reconfigure their body form to adapt to the environment and tasks. Normally that's not that surprising um, or that's not that uh, big an issue, but if you're working with someone who cannot make up their mind or if you're working in an environment that are uh, often hazardous, this is exactly the problem that you would have as an engineer or a ro roboticist because you would not know how to design your robot or how to control it. And we design robots to address this type of situation. How do you make robots to be more adaptable to the changing environment? So you're talking about smaller robots with a more collective intelligence. Right, so most of our robots are mesoscale. So when I say mesoscale, they are a little bigger than micro, a little smaller than macro. Um, the reason is we're, I think, the humans are about mesoscale. I mean, we measure, I'm, I'm a little smaller than most people, <laughs> but what we interact with is the world where a lot of centimeter scale objects are around. So our robots are built to be interactive with us uh, humans uh, in our daily activities. And these robots are called RoboGamis? Most of my robots are called RoboGamis. The, it's coined word from origami, robot, RoboGamis. The inspiration comes from paper art, the folding of paper art, um, because our robots just fold themselves to transform their body shape, to adapt to the world and to different tasks. And they were inspired from end colonies I've read. Some of the applications are inspired by our nature. Uh, and one of the tribots, another uh, Robogami, we take the inspiration from how ants do a collective behavior. So if you take a single ant, it's very small and very weak, but in the colony format, they can do a lot of things like you know, searching for food, going over obstacles, pushing the obstacles around, building bridges, and that's what we try to achieve with our Robogamis. That would be one application. Do you have other applications of those robots? Right, so because these Robogamis are made by not the traditional way of building robots, these Robogamis are built by layer by layer of different materials that are core materials and components for robots. And the reason that we do that is because we can keep the manufacturing costs down and still keep the overall accuracy and precision of the system to be optimal. And that means we can build a very precise robot at a very low cost, meaning we can do mass production. And if you can mass produce these tiny robots, you can create colonies of them. And they can communicate with each other and collaborate and cooperate to do different tasks. <laughs> Uh, 
<laughs> no? And because we can do that, we can think about sending them out in avalanche, desert, in space, to do the exploration task on behalf of us. And if you were to lose a couple of them on the way, no biggie, because we will have another set that will be coming next to our... And as, if I am a member of the general public, will I get to encounter those robots in my everyday life? Absolutely. Um, we actually have a joystick that can be used as if you're using a joystick to play a game, but this is type of joystick that will do extra stuff. For example, they can actually give you a feedback of what you're seeing on screen. Let me give you an example. If you were to go for a grocery shopping online, normally people don't do that to buy fresh vegetables. Why is that? You never know if they're fresh enough or hard enough. I like my peaches really um, hard, but some people like it a little softer. But you can never select those on an online grocery shopping. But imagine if you had a joystick that can give you back the force feedback of how hard your peaches are or your pillows, how firm your pillows or mattresses are. And this is all possible using origami robot in a tiny format of a joystick. Incredible. And actually, you mentioned the use of robogamis in space. There is an EPFL association who has developed an augmented reality escape game on smartphone, featuring your robots as the structure for a future lunar base. Let's have a look. Your robots are truly reinventing the definition of robotics. What would be your definition of a robot? It's pretty simple. My definition of robot is intelligent systems that react to the environment, changing environment. And do you think that this definition has evolved also with the pandemic? Definitely. Um, we don't necessarily think about how we all benefit from technology during the pandemic uh, immediately, um, but we did. The world did not collapse after all. Not for many of us, actually. That's why we have not experienced um, massive uh, depression uh, in the past two years. I believe it's because the technology that we have around us allowed us to communicate constantly, and that allowed us to keep our works going. However, this is not the case for more manual or physical work, and that's why those sectors suffered a lot. Imagine if you had a robot that allows you to communicate physically with the world. And that's not just relevant for people who has this type of job description, but imagine you got to communicate with your neighbors, you got to communicate with your colleagues, you got to communicate with your teachers and students. But what was missing? Going out, having a beer with them, going out, hugging them, going out, shaking hands with them. And that is still missing. Imagine if you had a robot that allows you to actually feel handshake. Imagine if you can have a, a feel on your body when someone pokes you or like it. So this is a type of application that we are looking at with my robots. And yet, voila, bon appétit. I missed you, baby sweet. Honey, it's beautiful. Just put your feet up, relax. And you see, think this is the vision uh, for tomorrow, for the future? I think the future of robotics is not necessarily having imposing robots around us, but robots that are blended seamlessly into our daily activities. For example, communication. And you're, you're also a professor at TPFL. Do you also see this vision of robotics evolving with the work of students, for instance? Um, luckily, I am fortunate enough to meet a lot of students throughout the semester. I have grand classes with that fills up the um, amphitheater. And what I've realized in the past decade is that 
um, in the beginning when I first joined the school, the de my definition of robots being completely soft, reconfigurable was very foreign to not only the older colleagues, senior colleagues, but also to the students. The immediate question was, oh, Jamie, is that really a robot? doesn't look like it. Because most of the notion of robots were based on the Hollywood movies. Rigid, imposing, strong, heavy, dangerous. But now, I don't know if it's cultural movement uh, or cartoons, but the yeah, understanding and the acceptance of robots being much softer, intuitive, adaptable has become the words I associate robots with. So definitely I've seen the change in vision and understanding of what robots can do for us. And of course, you're also contributing to that, at least uh, at TPFL. Oh, that's very kind of you. Were you always fond of uh, engineering? I think I was always fond of creating new things and being proud of them, regardless of how amazing it was or not, objectively, but subjectively, I was always proud of creating something new and excited about it. And you were an artist as well. Artist is a very um, uh, 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 forgiving term, but uh, since I like to express my interest of the world through um, any type of medium, um, clay, photography, paint, acrylic, it was my medium when I was younger. And now I guess my medium is micro, micro electronics, actuators and sensors. So you do not always see yourself as the next uh, researcher in the robotic field when you were like six or seven? Absolutely not. I actually wanted to be a, a, a sculptor. I wanted to actually use a very hard medium like rocks and um, uh, alloy metals to create a very large sculpture. That was what I wanted to be. And I ended up going to engineering school and creating different things that actually start moving as well. And is this a message that you're trying to communicate also with the students that don't really know what they want to do at the start of their studies. Yeah, I think nowadays students are very much more informed of the job possibilities and different types of job descriptions that's out there. We really do not know what kind of jobs there will be in the next 35 years um, because most of the jobs will actually change their definition of what they're supposed to do. So I, one of my advice, my, my tiny advice to students is that don't fear what you need to do um, in the future. Think about what you could do now that would expand your horizons and options of what you could do potentially in the future because no one really knows what's going to happen in the future. We, who knew we would be in a pandemic for two years? So let's have a look at your logbook Life from the Moon. Art or robots? Robots. Future or past? Future. Swimming or surfing? Surfing. Good to know that you still have some time to surf with uh, all that you do uh, in your life. You're also very active in the promotion of science. Why is that important to you? They're saying um, with power it comes responsibilities and with knowledge there's a lot of responsibility as well. And to be an engineer, um, you need to study a lot. So with knowledge, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with it. And I think as an engineer, we have responsibility toward our society. Whatever life holds in store for me, I will never forget these words. With great power comes great responsibility. This is my gift, my curse. Who am I? I'm Spider-Man. Everything we see here, right in front of you, microphone, lighting, camera, it's all product of engineering studies. So whatever we do, whatever we create, whatever we model, whatever we simulate, it will return to society. And we should keep that in mind all the time. And this is one of the reasons I, I like to stress to all my students who's taking my classes, that whatever they're studying right now, whether they use it immediately or not, if they stay in the field or not, they have to keep in mind the knowledge they have learned and learned uh, during their studies will eventually come out to return to the society. 
and I hope that becomes a positive one. And talking about society and the challenges of today, what do you think about diversity in sciences? Is, is that still a challenge? I think diversity in anything or any media or anything that we do in society is still a challenge. Not necessarily because it's getting discriminated, but because there's lack of education and there's a lot of um, effort that needs to change what's been done for so many years. Um, but we also understand diversity brings much bigger strength in anything. If you're just talking about materials alone, composite materials are known to be much stronger than the single base, the homogeneous material often. Um, same thing for the fabric of society. More the diversity we have, we would have a better and stronger society. And for engineers who's creating objects, structures, um, models, it's important to have a diversity in that because like I said, we have responsibility towards a society and society is not homogeneous. So more the diverse group of uh, scientists we have, we'll have a better solutions for diverse problems we'll face in the future and current. And are you witnessing improvements on that matter? I think there's more of a awareness and a lot of effort is going in and I think we should not be too hasty to see the results. As long as we keep at it because there's no end. We should always strive for excellence, we should always strive for equality, we should always strive for um, a fairness in everything we do. Jamie, we're already coming to the end of this episode. Do you want to share a final key message to leave us with? I would like to say, as a robotist, I always get asked, Jamie, when are robots coming to destroy our planet? Are you building um, terminators? And it got me thinking, because for me, that was never the definition of robot. For me, robot is just the, um, the advancement of technology that creates um, better tools for us to use, uh, help us with our, our lives that may be a little too complex or too manual or too dangerous. Um, so to me, the future of robotics and the future of technology is really about giving us more options. So that means not necessarily dystopia nor uh, paradise, but having tools that let us to, to be more us, to, to help us be more human, and to let us do whatever we want to do better and enable us actually as well. Robots for Humanity. Jamie, researcher, innovator, and surfer. Thank you so much for joining us. And please, when you come back, bring us some of your robogamis for Lunar Habitat here. Absolutely. Thanks, Chloe. The future sounds exciting, even if you're still an Earthwalker. Thank you for watching this episode and see you next time in space.